Uh, so good afternoon and welcome to our final CERC talk of 2016. For those joining us for the first time or those uh, unacquainted with me, my name is Mimi Marcus and I work with the Systems Engineering Research Center in operations, generally behind the scenes. Um, but thank you all for joining us. Uh, I know with, uh, for many of the academia participants, they're likely in the end of semester rush. So definitely appreciate uh, you participating and for everyone taking the time out of your day to join us for this session. Uh, I hope you find the discussion beneficial and we encourage your active participation. So some pointers on the participation tools. Uh, please note that while you're muted, you can utilize the chat feature for comments as well as the Q&A module for questions. And following the presentation, there'll be five minutes dedicated to any questions or comments not addressed during the presentation. Um, for our participants joining strictly through the phone connection only, please note that the slides are up on the CERC website for you to follow along with and you can email your questions or comments directly to me for inclusion in our discussion at M Marcus at stevens.edu. Uh, so now it's my privilege to introduce you our presenters today. Many of uh, the CERC collaborators are probably well familiar with. Um, and if not, you're in for a treat. Uh, Drs. Donna Rhodes and Adam Ross are both CERC principal and co-principal investigators for multiple CERC research tasks. Um, continuations of the interactive model-centric systems engineering and the ITAP collaboration research projects. Dr. Rhodes serves as the Director and Principal Research Scientist for MIT's Systems Engineering Advancement Research Initiative, a research group uh, focused on advancing the theories, methods, and effective practice of systems engineering applied to complex socio-technical systems through collaborative research with industry and government. And Dr. Rhodes is a lead research scientist and co-founder of the Systems Engineering Advancement Research Initiative. Uh, their best paper words are numerous and well-deserved, as is their involvement in the SE community in general uh, with uh, INCOSI and IEEE participation. Um, I could extensively go on, but I'll leave room for today's start talk. Uh, why is human model interactivity important to the future of model-centric systems engineering? And with that, I hand that off to you. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm on slide three, our title slide, and I'm going to be switching to slide four now. So to kick things off, I'd like to talk a little bit about the answer to the question as we see it. Um, we see that, uh, first of all, of course, everyone recognizes that addressing complex systems problems is going to require both human intelligence and use of models, especially as we start getting into the future where our models are more sophisticated. Our models, um, first of all, can be useful for generating data that humans use in decision making. And at the same time, we have these cognitive limits that drive um, us to use models and to use computational resources as well. And we know uh, we can start to uh, now have models do things automatically for us, certain functions that uh, could be done in the past only by humans. But it's really the humans who provide that context. Um, when is this model useful? When is it appropriate to use? And to sum up, we think the true power is in having effective interactivity makes models useful at the speed of human decision making. And that really underlies our research program, and if you flip to slide five, uh, the motivation behind this program is to really look intensely at the human model interaction. And there has been relatively little investigation of this specifically, even though we've made a lot of progress on model-centric efforts across the community. Um, underlying our research are a number of different areas, four of them um, shown uh, in the upper right. And first of all, the whole underpinning and theory and the knowledge we have around complex systems, um, the whole model-based engineering as it's progressed, and then uh, big data and visual analytics being two others. A key point, I think, is 
in the work is that uh, we consider humans not to be customers of the model-centric environments per se, but really endogenous to these interactive environments. On slide six, uh, we think we're headed really toward kind of a science of human model interaction. And a lot of work has been done in the past, and some of it has to do with sort of mechanistic aspects, like what tasks one has to perform when doing model-based work, for example. Um, and there are some related areas, such as human systems integration, which has become a very mature field now. But this is really about humans and operational systems, whereas our models are abstract and we use artificial data. Human-computer interaction is a second related field, and we can draw a lot from that, but the focus there is really on designing computer interfaces that are um, making the computer more effective for our human use. And the science of visual analytics, which I'll mention again in a few moments. So we're really trying to build out this, this field or subfield of human model interact interactivity. On slide seven, you'll see a few of the questions that we see as important in our work. And they revolve around how do humans actually interact with these models and model-generated information? And not only that, but while using models, how do humans interact with each other? What are some of the cognitive challenges that we face and what are those essential roles for all of the humans within the model-centric environment? And then finally is just how can this interactivity be made more effective? So beginning with um, slide eight, we'd like to introduce a little bit of the research that we have with some of the interim findings. We're in our third year of the research and uh, we've made some uh, progress in a number of areas not all of them will be presented today, but they're available in our CERC reports and papers. So the first uh, segment I'd like to highlight is some of the studies that we have going on in really investigating human model interaction. On slide nine, you'll see um, that in 2015, early 2015, we had a Pathfinder workshop which brought together a number of the experts in the community. And one of the questions we posed to the group during that workshop was, um, if you imagined your ideal world of humans and models working together, what would that look like? And on the left side, you'll see a statement that one of the participants expressed. And you can see a couple of key features of this are intuitive experience, that you're able to generate these deep insights and of course you're balancing time, resources, and the confidence that you desire in the decision outcome. And some of the emergent themes that came out of this that you'll see on the right side of the slide have really motivated some of the specific research activities that we're doing under this program. And that Pathfinder report is available on the CERC website. Going to slide 10, uh, we don't have a lot of real empirical knowledge about humans and models as in, an, in the model-centric environment and how this interaction happens. And to kick things off, we started to look at some analogy cases, things where we had humans um, that in the past were doing things um, more, say, with a workbench type of environment suddenly having to deal with doing it in a way that involved a lot of abstraction and some autonomy. And the first study that we did was to look into the transition from traditional cockpits to glass cockpits, because that's a bit of what people experience, say, if they've never been in a model-centric environment and they immerse themselves in a, in a state-of-the-art environment. In this study, um, we of course, saw things like um, air crashes that resulted from things like mode errors, thinking you were in one mode, but you were really in another, or errors that occurred through 
selecting something from a drop down list and just trusting kind of that your system had suggested the right thing. And so it's very easy to think that maybe we might have the same kinds of things happening when you have uh, an engineer sitting in front of a computer and using some automated software that's giving them information from a model. Um, another thing that was kind of interesting was that in one study that was done, they found that in the glass cockpit, pilots thought they were performing better, but they were actually performing worse. So we really need, um, we need to think about these things and we need to think about all the cognitive and perceptual challenges that we're seeing in these types of studies and what it might um, mean for us and what we have to investigate. So um, going to slide 11, we've been looking at the um, background on visual analytics that began to emerge as a uh, field about a little over a decade ago. And visual analytics is the science of analytic reasoning facilitated by visual interactive interfaces. Uh, there was a report put out in 2005 on, called Illuminating the Past that spelled out some of the research agenda around this. So the focus is really humans and computers, the collaboration between them, and how to solve problems. And Visual analytics are used quite heavily in a number of different fields. So if you go to slide 12, um, this is an interactive slide for those following on PDF. Uh, so we've been working on different prototypes to say how could we take some of the methods that we use today and make them more interactive. And you're seeing here a prototype visualization tool that was developed by one of our doctoral students, Mike Curry. Uh, you're looking at a trade space and you're looking at um, the Pareto front there with the red circles. And classically, you'll be selecting something off the Pareto front as being the, say, the best solution you could get for a given cost. Um, in the upper right corner, you see context and preference. So these represent preferences, just identification of stakeholder number eight's preferences for what they want in a system. Um, context, so uh, bringing in the idea of context where context might mean um, you know, that there's a given available set of technology, that there are certain policies in place, there's a certain mission for the system. And those red circles represent good solutions under that context. But what happens if you change your context? And if you watch um, the red dots on the Pareto front now, and especially keep your eye on the one that's above the $1,000 mark on the x-axis, you'll see when I change the context that those Pareto front solutions move. Yet that particular solution that was on the 1,000 mark actually was the one uh, solution that did not move. So the question is, well, why? What is that? How do we actually explore things to get a closer look at that? You can't get a lot from just looking at the points on the graph. So Mike added a parallel coordinate plot so that you could then look under the covers and look at what the design variables and performance attributes and um, value attributes look like. And then if you select, whoops, sorry. If you select a given point in your de design space, then you'll be able to see exactly what that looks like. This is available on the link that's provided on the slide if you want to play around with it. So um, we're, we're experimenting with these prototype visualization tools. On the next slide, though, um, Mike Curry has been starting to ask the question, well, what about visualization and interaction as far as their effect on human performance? Do they matter? And it turns out there's not a lot of research on this. So Mike designed an experiment where he's decoupled uh, visualization and interaction and kind of a surrogate design task to see what the impacts are. He has two different cohorts going through, of course, graduate student population, and then the second are volunteers that come from Amazon Turk. And he's analyzing these sets separately. 
um, in the study, in the experiment, there's a random assignment to one of four different interfaces. One is just a plain table of data. The second is an interactive table. The third is a static visualization. And the fourth is an interactive visualization. And we'll be getting a glimpse of um, whether visualization matters, whether interaction matters. And this is um, just ongoing as we speak. We're starting to see a few things emerge from it, but stay tuned in the coming months for what kinds of insights we get in that study. So all of these things are trying to build out um, our real empirical knowledge around this whole area. So now I'm going to turn um, to slide 14 and turn things over to Adam to speak on another research area. Thank you, Donna. So uh, I'm going to pick up here talking about some research highlights related to our work in framing multi-stakeholder trade space exploration. Uh, specific expected outcomes include recommendations for framing trade space exploration to enhance multi-stakeholder decision making. So move on to slide 15. So uh, just some base concept setting here. Um, trade space exploration, as Donna had uh, shown a scatter plot earlier, um, is a, a method of trying to understand the inherent trades amongst many different alternative uh, system designs for a particular uh, problem that you're trying to solve. Um, we've been doing trade space exploration research for 16 years uh, here in the group, and um, we found it to be very successful in getting people to think more holistically about their design problems. Um, we emphasize the concept of exploration over analysis and over optimization, especially in early phase design when you don't necessarily know exactly what is the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, so the basic idea behind trade space exploration is you cast a wide net, you look at many alternatives, including those that are, on the face of it, kind of dumb, things that you probably wouldn't ever pick. Uh, and the reason for that is because you want to have enough data points in order to generate insight into patterns of, of relationships between factors in your control, that are the designs, and um, outcomes, um, usually expressed in terms of some sort of value attributes, such as benefits and costs, here utility, dimensionless, and life cycle cost, uh, and millions. Um, and the, the Typical plot that we would use is a scatter plot as our high-level view, but every one of those points has a whole set of data behind it, usually generated by some form of model or simulation, or it could be from empirical data or expert opinion, what have you. Um, but the basic idea is not to give you the answer, but rather to understand the, the trade-offs that are inherent in these complex systems um, and how maybe the best solution or most efficient solutions for one person may not be the best or most efficient solutions for someone else. And in fact, that's what motivated now, the next piece there on the bottom, MSTSE, or multi-stakeholder trade space exploration, that is the recognition, like I guess the emergent recognition that we found in using trade space exploration and trade spaces as boundary objects for communicating between stakeholders who may or may not have the same expectations on what good means for a system. Because uh, at the end of the day, uh, design is a is a subjective endeavor. There's no right answer. Um, there are fundamental relationships in the physics of the problem, but there are lots of trade-offs, and you have to choose where you're going to fall in those trade-off curves. So MSTSC, the idea was to use trade space exploration as a, as a unique and powerful mechanism for finding better solutions than would have been found otherwise. Uh, and over time, it's been identified as a key component of trade space exploration more generally and resilient systems research agenda specifically. Okay, next slide, 16. So what's the idea here? Well, the vision is to be able to create, use, and share trade space data with multiple diverse decision makers in a way that makes sense to them and is based on a common set of data. Um, so that way it's all traceable to the same set of evidence. People can care about different things, um, but they can agree perhaps on um, the underlying um, evidence for making decisions. So the top piece here shows some figures, some images from a study we did in 2009 on a uh, satellite radar system where there were two clearly very different kinds of missions that were trying to use the same platform. And these different missions uh, drove designs in different directions. And uh, this was a, a very challenging design problem as evidenced by repeated canceled real world programs. And what we were told by government industry was part of the challenge was that the missions are kind of divergent but the dollar category for building these types of systems is so high that you need to have a group of 
uh, folks come together to, to show that it's worth investing such a large amount of money in such a system. And so you have this perverse challenge of trying to get more and more stakeholders to agree when you're in fact having more likely case that more and more they're going to disagree. And so the question is, can you find solutions that are going to satisfy multiple stakeholders, maybe not all, and how do you trade that benefit off with cost? Um, but what we found is that when you move from a single stakeholder decision problem um, where your, your question is, well, what do I want, and then applying modeling and simulation and trade space exploration to discover what you can get, uh, the real, the next question is, well, what can we agree on? And that's actually a different problem. Um, what we found in the early days of exploring multi-stakeholder trade space exploration was we stuck a bunch of decision makers or analysts in a room, each with their own trade space, interactive trade spaces, and we had them try to come to uh, agreement on their own. And what ended up happening was every individual would explore their trade spaces by themselves, uh, get a sense of uh, kind of a mental model a validation sense of what's going on, you know, in, in the problem here, what do good solutions look like, they identify solutions that they like, and then they would come together and say, well, I like this system, well, I like this system, and I like this system, how can we compromise from there? And that was kind of the, the set of language that was used at the time, compromise, quote unquote. Um, and it ended up being pretty powerful because everyone could understand um, where requirements were uh, butting up against each other, identify what was driving cost, identify where stakeholders maybe agreed on something and disagreed on something else. Um, but we felt like there was probably a lot more rigor that could go into this if we didn't do it in an ad hoc manner. Um, we're going to go into slide 17 now. And in fact, uh, one of our undergraduate students who was with us on our original project stayed on for grad school and moved on to a PhD, and he thought it would be a really interesting PhD topic. Uh, so here is a summary of his PhD that he finished up in June, um, and he basically wanted to start uh, back from first principles and ask the first question, um, are the principles of trade space exploration aligned with those of complex socio-technical negotiations? And in here he importantly addressed the right literature, that is the negotiation literature, and he addressed faculty and experts in the field to understand what is the state of the art and the state of practice in negotiation. Um, what are the likewise attributes of trade space exploration? How do these align or not? Um, and the, the answer is they align very, very well, and it was quite exciting to find that. Um, the second question was, you know, in going from single stakeholder trade space exploration to multi-stakeholder trade, trade space exploration the way we did, do we introduce any unintentional framing effects? Does this affect decisions and can they be controlled? Short answer is yes, we actually did uh, have unintentional framing effects, and I'll talk a little bit about this on the next slide. Um, the third question is, can you incorporate MSTSC in actual design processes, trying to get to some prescription around how one might use this? Uh, and Matt wrote a, a paper on this that in COSI uh, we presented in July um, that talks about things that one can do. Um, and he conducted a bunch of interviews with practitioners um, and looked at ways to insert MSTSC into existing techniques. And the last question is, can you use the concepts like flexibility and agility and adaptability to break impasses to add uh, value in thinking about creative alternatives in a time-phased manner. That is, maybe we don't have to come up with a solution that makes everyone happy today, but rather something that can morph over time and be happy to the right person at the right time. And those kinds of questions really couldn't even be addressed until we had this dynamic trade space framework in place. Um, next slide, 18. Um, so one thing that Matt discovered was that there are two key types of frames that come into play in, in trade space exploration. Uh, one you call macro framing, and this is around kind of the values that stakeholders bring to the table, uh, a very meta sense of, you know, what do we consider fair? Um, do I care about things beyond the explicit performance attributes that we're considering in our modeling and simulation? Um, are we even using the same language? Are we talking past each other? Um, this is in the realm of beliefs and perspectives. And unfortunately, what we found is in practice, uh, often in engineering um, techniques, they just assume um, a particular like utilitarian approach, for example, and never make this an explicit part of the conversation. And what we found was it was important that people make it explicit. You don't have to agree, but by making it explicit, you make it more likely uh, that everyone can agree on the process as being fair uh, and that their particular interests are addressed. Uh, the second issue is what we call micro-framing, and this has to do with how information is presented within the particular problem at hand. This has to do with, you know, what type of scatter plots do you use, what axes do you use, uh, do you have bounds, what criteria are you using, and the particular issues you run into here have to do with your own individual cognitive and perceptual limitations. What can I understand and what can I see? And there's a lot of research that's been done out there already in this space, 
um, that can be taken advantage of things around bound rationality, for example, uh, how much can we think about at once, uh, and prospect theories, how do we frame goods, good and bad things, um, and how does that affect our attitudes towards negotiation process? And so you can see a little picture in the bottom there that perceived value of gains versus losses is an asymmetric relationship around a baseline. Um, this is really critical because how you set up the problem will affect how people um, can um, come to an agreement or not. So two people could be looking at the same solution and, and one could view it as a gain and one could view it as a loss and have a very different uh, approach to it. Um, and so these were really good, uh, two very good and important frames that you must consider uh, in negotiations. So next slide, 19. Um, so in order to address these, Matt came up with three major areas of recommendations, uh, problem formulation, uh, modeling evaluation, and exploration analysis. Um, as I mentioned, these are described in his thesis and uh, in the paper that we just presented in July. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, all of these factors are important. Um, and making them explicit and talking about them actually helps you control for a bunch of risk factors that might crop up uh, in terms of talking past each other, in terms of uh, raising tensions, in terms of uh, building trust and confidence in the process itself. Uh, next slide, 20. Um, in fact, this is one of his key insights that, um, first of all, in the negotiation literature, you never use the word compromise because compromise is always associated with giving something up for someone or to someone. Um, Instead, you talk about negotiations um, and you try to frame it as a win for everyone. Um, and so your baseline against which you compare things is your BATNA, your best alternative to negotiated agreement. Um, this resulted uh, in new visualizations that Matt developed uh, through the use of experiments, identifying how you present the information will affect people's perceptions of gains and losses and their willingness to, uh, to concede and to make uh, proposals to other, uh, other negotiated parties. Um, he also found that trade spaces were actually quite useful for generating insight um, and that uh, a lot of the models um, and the ex exploration of their data um, was really a social process in terms of understanding where the data com comes from, in terms of comparing internal mental models uh, to the, the data that's at hand, um, talking to each other, so human to human with using uh, models as a boundary object. Uh, as a common uh, source for um, communication um, and kind of appreciating the fact that you could have a great model, but if, if people don't trust where the information came from, they may not be willing to use it for making decisions. And so techniques from the negotiation world, such as joint fact finding as a way to build trust in how the data was generated uh, was essential for conducting successful negotiation. So uh, his dissertation is on our website. Um, feel free to take a look at that for further information. Uh, next slide, 21. All right, I'm going to return to uh, the subject of model-centric decision-making uh, as far as the sense of trying to develop some kind of empirical underpinning for this. So if you go to slide 22, um, think about what the elements of model-centric decision-making are. Um, certainly we have our, our digital thread, our digital system model, uh, and other types of models that are, are important in our environment. We have the decision to be made itself, and then we have the human actors. And on slide 23, um, we've elaborated some of the human actors that we're interested in so far as studying how these people interact with models and what does it mean. And we look at this from the standpoint of individuals and also teams. On slide 24, uh, you'll see some of the points around an ongoing effort that we have we're about midway in this exploratory study, which is an interview-based study. And we've been talking with some um, very senior people in our systems engineering model-centric kind of community. And we're, uh, we're really trying to get a better understanding how these individuals make decisions with models and especially um, how they build their trust in models to what to degree do they use these models to make their decisions. Out of this, um, I expect that we're going to get some key insights that may help us to inform practice, but we'll also probably determine some areas where we need more study since this is an exploratory study that's being undertaken by one of our master's students. Um, so I want to share, uh, starting on slide 25 now, some of the snippets of interim findings that we have. Um, the first one revolves around transparency and trust. And 
you know, question is um, how much transparency do you desire when you're making decisions with models? And um, some of the quotes are, you know, I want to see all the way down to my code, or um, I don't look at the lowest level because I have people that do that for me, or um, I just want somebody I trust. I don't want to really look under the covers of what's going on in this model. So I think the bottom line that we found so far is that everyone cares about transparency, but they personally may not need to see the code underlying it. They let other people do that for them. Um, if you go to slide 26 now, we've been looking for some of the biases that are involved here. Um, none of them are probably surprising to you. We know these things exist already, but the objective here, of course, is to collect the empirical evidence that they do. Um, the first one that I'll highlight is uh, confirmation bias and the fact that uh, when you are a modeler uh, or an analyst and you bring information to a senior decision maker, for example, um, that decision maker often already knows the answer they want. And um, it was quoted here from one of the participants, long hard battle to convince them the model is giving insights into other things that should be considered. Uh, another um, bias example is what we've termed model investment bias. And there definitely seems to be something to the fact that the more uh, money and time we invest in developing our models, we just have no choice but to believe it. And that, of course, is a little bit dangerous. Um, so why do we care about these biases? Um, if you go back to the glass cockpit study, for example, it was shown in that study that there was automation bias, that people um, thought that the computer-generated information that the system was just giving them smart information. And through a study, uh, it was concluded that just making people aware that automation bias exists actually resulted in better performance. So here we're looking for things that we can introduce into our education systems and so forth as we go forward in these model-centric environments. Looking at trust, slide 27, we found both technological factors and social factors are important. Um, the technological ones, you see a short list of them on the left side there, transparency, documentation, et cetera, and then the social factors, which have to do with um, credibility of individuals involved in model-centric decision-making, um, model origin, um, who created this model, what, how much expert opinion is in it, and so forth. And flipping then to slide 28, uh, what we found was sort of an interesting pattern here, that in the model-centric decision-making, at least what we're doing today from the people that we've talked to, there seems to be this three-actor kind of flow. There are people who are close to the models, developing the models, um, generating data from the models. There's a, a through person and then the two person. And let's say the two person is a senior decision-maker they're actually using that through person as, as the um, person who's going to provide them with the information that the model has generated as passed through. Um, they, the two person doesn't seem to care about what's under the covers of the model. It's really all about how much that they trust that through person. So this is an interesting pattern that's shown up. And of course, um, on the bottom there you see that we see as we get farther um, from the left to the right, we see the interest in the social factors increasing, whereas uh, going toward the left side, you'll see the technological factors as being more important. And this is, of course, preliminary, and th but this um, does seem to be a prevalent pattern. Going to slide 29. Uh, we also see this essential need for having high interactivity of these human actors. There may be um, different of, of the, these patterns of three that are going on in layers or, or turn it around going on in silos. And that the buy-in and the trust really emerges from this back and forth activity between these human actors and the decision flows. So, 
Uh, now I'd like to turn to the next topic on slide 30. And this gets to the nature of the model-centric environments themselves and the care and feeding of those environments. Going to slide 31, uh, we have looked at, well, what kinds of decisions are really involved as we get into very complex systems and use of models? We had a case that was done by one of our master's students who was looking at it from the perspective of an airport collaborative decision-making system. And you'll see an illustration of some of the information that came out of that below. Um, there are many different types of models. There are libraries of models. There are libraries of data sources. There are economic models. There are uh, belief models. There are visualization techniques. And so when you see yourself faced with an environment of this complexity, you're going to be asking questions like, what are the models I want to use? What, um, what trades do I have to make? Where does my data come from? And very importantly, um, what of these models can be composed? How do I go about planning for the composability of my models? Next slide, 32. We're starting to think about the fact that we really probably need a specialized role here. And so we've been looking at the idea of a model curation function or a model curator role for the environment. And it's really motivated by the fact that, of course, our legacy models are not often used uh, as much as we would like them to be. We have a lot of duplication then across programs. Um, there's not specific trust in some of the models. And the competency of the modeling um, efforts is really often distributed across many individuals in many different organizations, and we don't have a good way of leveraging that across programs at an enterprise level. So, um, too, as these things grow more complex, we need more specialized knowledge. And we want humans to be treated as a part of this environment. So the question is really, would a model curation role um, help us with these challenges and needs? And if so, what kind of competencies would that individual or that group of individuals need? And you can think of this somewhat equivalent to the idea of a museum curator. Uh, that curator is responsible for all the care and feeding of, of the assets in their museum. And they are the person who retains kind of the history of it. And they are also a person that you go to if you need a special exhibit set up or if you needed to borrow a painting from another museum. So if you flip to slide um, 33, we use that kind of as an analogy to start thinking about what would a model curation leadership role look like. And the um, digital engineering working group in the DOD has come up with a good set of fundamentals concerning model-centric engineering digital engineering, and they stated that uh, the responsibility for models, simulations, the data rights, and so forth, and the whole environment belongs to the program manager, who may then delegate that to a systems engineer. The question is, um, can these very busy people support this kind of role going forward in the future as we become increasingly model-centric in how we do our engineering? So we've started to say, well, maybe we need a specialized role for this, a person that is in that position who is the process owner for the environments, who manages the, the data in the model repositories and the IP. Um, they help you select models when you have a new program. They help you to understand your risk. They negotiate whether you want to borrow a model from another organization or, say, another company or another government agency. And they are the ones who retain this deep knowledge of model trades and composability. And they are also the protector of the model pedigree. And if you go now to slide um, 34, um, we believe there is a need for us in our field to standardize or, or some kind of model pedigree or reference model for a model pedigree. And model pedigree is not new. Uh, as far as I can tell, it came out in about the 1979 time frame out of the OR community. And it was first called by Saul Gass and, uh, and Lambert Jolt a model demographics. 
and it really was all the information that's associated with the model in terms of the um, past achievements, the underlying methodology, all the advice that went into the model. And about a year later, you see publications from Solgas that called it a model pedigree, and that's kind of stuck. Um, we're currently gathering information from the literature and all the discussions that we're having with experts to try to say, well, what would our systems engineering model pedigrees look like? And we're planning to then engage the larger community around an effort to perhaps create some kind of reference or standard for pedigrees that could be used by others. Now let's switch to um, a, something up starting in slide 35. Um, what are some of the implications for practice out of the, some of the things that we've seen? Um, there are many. I'm just going to highlight a few in particular, especially coming out of the empirically, um, empirical study for the interview-based work. So on slide 36, humans in model-centric environments. We're starting to close the gap between model and decision and that human that lies in the middle. So we as humans can sit down at our computer and we have our models and we, we create our models and we make decisions with our models and we make good decisions, we think, because we like our models, we created them. And Saul Gass said in 1990, the merging of the user and the modeler should cause cautionary alarms to go off. And I think that's very true for where we see some of the things headed in our community. So what does that mean? Well, we really need to be aware um, of these cognitive and perceptual biases that we have. And we recognize that trust in models needs to be um, earned. And so we think we need to kind of preserve that triad that, um, that from, through, to. And it may not be all individual human decision makers and actors in there. It may be that there's AI or automation involved. But somehow we need the checks and balances, and whether it's peer reviews or getting others to um, independent reviewers of our models and so forth. We need more in our decisions than creating our models, running our models, and making our decisions all as individual actors. In slide 37, we think that enabling human model teaming is really important. That um, if we look at the fact that we're noticing the high degrees of interaction that are needed within individual layers or across layers between actors, sometimes the modelers talk to senior decision makers, for example. It's not always this, this three-step process. Uh, the key thing is that we need to eliminate any barriers so we can have very good conversations about that. And we can use methods and tools to help with our immersive collaboration. But in the end, we really need to have a culture of openness and being able to question the assumptions for this to be successful. And in slide 38, we're advocating for looking into this curation leadership role and really how can we make this a little bit more of a science to have some more formality around it, to have some empirical basis that underlies it. So we believe this is a strategic leadership role that is beyond what a PM or systems engineer could handle. It's beyond what would be handled under configuration management. We need to mature these processes. We need to understand what goes in a pedigree and we need to preserve these artifacts and the voice of the experts. And one of the things, of course, say in creating a model pedigree that people have always hated is sitting down and having to write pages and pages of rationale. But we can now encode, um, you know, audio or visual uh, films of individuals talking about their models. So I think the process is easier, but the demand for this is much higher than it used to be and the importance is critical. Going to slide 39 now, uh, a summary of what we're doing. You'll see our stated research goal at the top, and it's about enabling intense human model interaction. It's about making decisions, and it's doing it quickly enough, but also cautiously. There are two 
things that we are using now as assumptions. Successful systems acquisition, development, and sustainment depends on effective human model teaming. And second, that our interactive model-centric environments are going to necessitate specialized leadership competencies. And that concludes our highlights. We have, as mentioned, a number of papers and um, CERC reports that go into much more detail than this. There are several different activities that we've done under the research that are not included in this talk. So uh, that will leave us with some time for questions. Excellent. Thanks, Donna. I don't know if you saw, we had a, a few questions. I think uh, the first one was pretty much covered by Adam, uh, but it was when defining context is an element, the, the human preference base for taking in information. In other words, in a given context, in a given situation, uh, my situation awareness is individually built based on my cognitive defaults and preferences. Is this part of your model? I see that the decoupling addresses part of this, but the fundamental question remains. Um, so I don't know if you want to further expand on, on it, Adam. Um, sure. So I guess it depends on the particular application case. There are a couple, couple of ways in which we address this. Um, one, uh, at least in the trade space work, we talk about several different types of models. Um, and from a, an abstraction point of view, we found this to be quite useful. Um, one we call uh, evaluative models. Uh, these are models that try to predict, the, for example, the performance of a system, predict our cost, uh, and so forth. Um, and these are models that try to generate data that could have some ground truth associated with them. So eventually you can measure the actual, you know, the weight, or the, the cost, or the, the speed of the system. Um, the second class of models uh, are value models. So these are trying to represent how decision maker may interpret uh, the evaluative data in terms of determining goodness. Um, this will take into account things like preferences and how they wrap criteria together in their minds. Um, and all, like I said, all, all models are wrong. <laughs> value models in particular are, are challenging because it's even harder to value those. Uh, so it could be that for this particular question, a, a lot of this falls under the idea of our value model formulation. Um, in our epic era analysis technique, um, we try to partition uh, the world into different epochs. That is our time period of fixed context and needs. Uh, and the way that we operationalize that um, is we put um, everything outside of the system boundary into these two bins, needs and context. Um, and needs here are operationalized in terms of these value model instances. So what, what do we care about and how are they all wrapped together um, individually and in groups? And then context kind of encapsulates all of the other factors that are outside of our control. Um, so in terms of this particular question, you might operationalize most of that in terms of different value models. Some of those may be correlated with different contexts or situations. Um, depends on the particular problem at hand. But, but I, think, I think that's how we would mostly address that. Excellent. And uh, it seems sort of like a follow-up to this, but uh, Stephen Gwein um, mentioned, you seem to be advocating for a role for the agnostic modeler who would have domains and modeling knowledge but not a vested interest in a particular situ uh, solution. What has been your feedback on how this type of role would be perceived in terms of model transparency and integrity? It seems like it should be received favorably. Um, so in the, uh, the agnostic modeler, uh, was, are you referring to the curator role? Non or non-advocate role? Um, I guess I still see modelers themselves as kind of have probably having a vested interest, but being balanced by having the use of non-advocates in the process, um, having the checks and balances you need to make sure that you're not introducing your own personal biases into it. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I could unmute uh, Stephen if he'd like to expand on his question further. Sure. So yeah, that's. Um, I, I guess what my question was was in terms of that, right? That balance of having someone that says, "Look, this is 
you know, I'm the caretaker for the model uh, within this domain space. Um, I have access to a good chunk of the data required for trades, but since I'm not vested in a particular solution for a project or program, uh, I'm here to just make sure that the model is leveraged properly, correctly, um, and we've got the right, you know, we've got the right data analysis algorithms, what have you. By having that type of role, does it, I mean, in your conversations, does it seem that people are saying, yeah, we kind of like to have someone who's kind of deeply invested in the model but not invested, say, in the programs, or does that role not really provide the trans, uh, transparency and value um, to, to organizations that are going to be leveraging these models? I just wanted to get your, what, how that's been perceived. Right, um, that's a very good question. And in the interviews that we've had so far, I would say we've had numerous people who have brought up the fact that it's very important to have independent reviews and non-advocates uh, involved in it. So I think that there is a strong uh, push for this. And that's why I also think that if we had this um, person or persons in this curation type function that they have to be people that stick around for a while. I mean, in order to, they have to be very um, neutral and independent and brokers of the information that would then come through in the pedigree of the model. And uh, of course, everyone has biases they introduce and things they're invested in, so it's not a perfect world, but I think that would be the quest as you're describing it. Oh, sorry, I was still on mute. <laughs> and uh, Stephen, you're actually still uh, unmuted. So I know you said you have a question on model visualization. Oh. So, oh, actually, let me unmute you. There you go. Oh, that's great. Thanks. So I love the example you had earlier where when you, I believe you changed the, the context, you saw the data points moved and one stood still. Um, and so my, my question is kind of to, as we start looking at how do we, you know, we kind of leverage that model visualization. I think you also talked about like different, kind of like different levels of decision makers and their uh, close, their proximity to the model or to the details of the model. Um, have you seen or have you heard concerns um, about deeper model of visualization kind of driving that whole uh, Dunning-Kruger effect where people have high power models and even though when you have detailed data like you showed, it, we, we start to get closer to making it easier to make wrong inferences, um, right, because, you know, we basically have nine decimal points of the wrong number, right? Instead of having, you know, two decimal points of the right number. Um, what type of, just interested to hear what kind of feedback or concerns you've, you've gotten during your conversations. Well, I think people um, definitely believe, first of all, that you need different types of representations and levels of um, how much information you're portraying depending on who the person is that you're sharing model-centric information with. Uh, I don't know that we have conclusions on this. We also recognize that people have individual preferences for how they process visual information or um, whether they prefer to see tables of data or graphs. Um, so I don't know that I can tell you a lot yet except that we need a lot more research around this and a lot more understanding before we can lead to the conclusion that a certain type of visual display of certain information at a certain fidelity will be the right thing, say, to show a senior decision maker. I think the community, Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. The community accepts that, that we need that, but we, we haven't yet come up with the right answers around that. Um, so I see um, Bill Chandel had a question on um, whether we had any insights from the research in the electronic game interaction. And Bill, I'm, guess, I'm guessing you mean there that um, have we kind of studied electronic game interaction as a case? The um, answer to that is we haven't specifically looked at that, although we have done some game-based 
best research in our work, and I would say, maybe Adam wants to comment on this, but I would certainly say that out of that work and watching people make decisions, we've seen that there are certain like strategies that individuals play out. They start to form patterns. And in the game itself, um, which Adam is um, one of the key developers of, um, we started to come up with, from an education standpoint, um, having them play different roles so that uh, we think perhaps it's important as we maybe get people to make decisions with models that we want them to experience like standing in the shoes of different types of actors. And do you have anything else yeah, to say? So, yeah, just a quick comment on that. So um, we had uh, a research thread in the group that was um, looking at leveraging game-based media for um, conducting systems research as well as for systems education and training. Um, and the particular things that we discovered in that space were around the, the art of video game design. Um, we actually worked with a number of game research groups here at MIT and, and elsewhere uh, on the quote unquote cutting edge of game-based research, which is actually pretty, it's not that well defined in this space. Uh, a lot of it's art. Um, we learned about good practices for visual design and um, that video games that look good sell better than video games that look bad, irrespective of the quality of the game itself. Um, I don't know if that's a, a good heuristic for our visual displays or not, but it seems like a cautionary tale to me. Um, but it also highlighted the importance of multi-channel communication um, that humans interact with information in more than just visual ways. Um, and I think when we talk about visual analytics, it's a little bit misleading because we're not just talking about visual channels for communication, but also the interactivity. And Donna was talking about that. And what does interactivity mean? It means touching, hearing, seeing, tasting, you know, all of these um, senses apply to the data uh, in a way that's kind of more experiential uh, because people get it better when it's experientially uh, communicated. And also the number of dimensions that we're talking about in these data sets is just tremendous. And uh, at any one point, we're only seeing a very small part of the elephant, uh, as it were. So um, video games are one medium where interactivity has been, you know, the key from the get-go, and so we wanted to leverage as much as we could from that. But there are a lot of cautionary tales that the the, the analogy doesn't apply directly, uh, and a lot of really, really bad video games out there were like, what do you say, like Grand Theft calculus or something, <laughs> where they apply the Grand Theft Auto idea to teaching calculus to high school kids, and it was a disaster because it just doesn't translate. And so um, when you're using a new medium, there are different rules of the road. And so we actually had some research in that space right. that we can right. talk about another time, I guess. Yeah, and um, there, there was also a question, um, what are the implications for educators? And I think there's a lot of them. Um, I, I hope that the information we have here can make its way into the classroom. In fact, we're currently working on an um, online uh, course that's going to be taught to a lot of people that we're trying to put some of these um, things into in terms of considerations. Um, some things like teaching people about the various biases, making them aware of that. We've seen indicators from other fields that that could be important, just getting people to understand these exist and know about them. Um, exposing students to different types of technology and the theory behind uh, models. Uh, there's a lot, I think, that could be taken from this and, of course, many other things that other researchers are doing to put into the classroom. And then I'm also interested in perhaps pursuing in the next, um, the next half of the semester some, I'm starting to build up some idea around what would uh, education venue look like for um, teaching people to immerse themselves in a model-centric visualization environment? What would we want to do? Uh, I believe um, we certainly heard a lot about, say, oh, teach students the tools. And, you know, that's not what we need to teach them. As you all know, we, we need to teach them about the methods and the underlying important um, theory. And so um, we are thinking around that. What is a what does an education venue look like versus a practitioner's venue? Excellent. Okay. Donna, I know, um, not to, to go past our, our time allotment, but I know you had previously mentioned that you were looking for uh, input um, and and uh, 
posing questions to, to people interested in this area. Is that still the case, or did you get enough feedback from our CERC collaborators? I know uh, Chris um, Jericho was one in particular. For the, for the interview-based study? Yes, yes. Yeah, well, um, for that one, we, we have now quite a pool, but I'm always interested in people who would be willing, and if we can't get them on this study, we will have plenty of opportunities in the future. And I'm also interested in people who are um, thinking about the model curation kinds of issues and the idea of model pedigree. And I'll be talking with people, for example, at the NCOSI um, model-based workshop coming up in January, but if you're not going to be in one of these types of activities that are coming up in the next month, um, I'd love to have your insights on that. Excellent. And on the, the CERC website, we'll have your, your contact information for sure to uh, have folks get in contact with you if you're interested in that. Um, oh, and thanks. Uh, just to kind of tail end, so we're respectful of everyone's time uh, as it's past 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, uh, the upcoming CERC topics uh, for the next CERC talks are taking place on February 1st, What is the Self, uh, being presented by Grady Booch, um, and April 5th, uh, by Dr. Paul Rosenblum, can graphical models provide a sufficient basis for general intelligence? Um, and we already do have some uh, suggestions for the following topics that you can find more information on the, the next topics on the CERC website. Um, so I think that wraps everything up for questions. If you do have additional uh, comments or questions that you'd like to pose, please feel free to uh, either send them to myself uh, at mmarcus. Um, at stevens.edu or, again, reaching out directly to uh, Dr. Donna Rhodes and Dr. Adam Ross. Um, thank you again so much for joining us, and thank you for presenting both of you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Take care.